Book One, Chapter Two of the Lancashire Witches. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter. The Lancashire Witches, A Romance of Pendle Forest, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Book One, Alison Device. Chapter Two, The Black Cat and the White Dove. Little Jennet watched her sister's triumphant departure with a look in which there was far more of envy than sympathy, and when her mother took her hand to lead her forth she would not go, but, saying she did not care for any such idle sights, went sullenly back to the inner room. When there, however, she could not help peeping through the window, and saw Susan and Nancy join the revel rout with feelings of increased bitterness. "'I wish it would rain and spile their finery.' she said, sitting down on her stool and plucking the flowers from her basket in pieces. And yet, why can't I enjoy such seats like other folk? The truth is, I've no heart for it. Folks say, she continued, after a pause, that Grandmother Demdike is a witch and can do as she pleases. I wonder if she made Alison so pretty. No, that cannot be, for Alison's no favourite of hern. "'If she loves any one, it's me. "'Why don't she make me good-looking, then? "'They say it's sinful to be a witch. "'If so, how come Grandmother Demdike to be one? "'But I'm observed that folks as calls her witch are afeard on her, "'so it may be pure spite on their part.' "'As she thus mused, a great black cat belonging to her mother, "'which had followed her into the room, rubbed himself against her putting up his back and purring loudly. "'Ah, Tib,' said the little girl, "'how are you, Tib? I didn't know you were here. Let me ask you some questions, Tib.' The cat mewed, looked up, and fixed his great yellow eyes upon her. "'One would think you understand what was said to you, Tib,' pursued little Janet. "'We can see what you say to this. Shall I ever be Queen of May like Sister Alison?' The cat mewed in a manner that the little girl found no difficulty interpreting the reply into no. "'How's that, Tib?' cried Janet sharply. "'If I thought you meant it, I'd beat you, Sarah. Answer me another question, you saucy knave. Who will be luckiest, Alison or me?' This time the cat darted away from her, and made two or three skirmishes round the room as if gone suddenly mad. "'I can make no to that.' observed Janet, laughing. All at once the cat bounded upon the chimney-board, over which was placed a sampler, worked with the name Alison. "'Why, Tib really seems to understand me, I declare,' observed Janet uneasily. "'I should like to ask him a few more questions, if I durst,' she added, regarding with some distrust the animal, who had now returned and begun rubbing himself against her as before. "'Tib! Tib!' The cat looked up and mewed. "'Pretty Tib, sweet Tib,' continued the little girl, coaxingly. "'What mun one do to be a witch like Grandmother Demdike?' The cat again dashed twice or thrice madly round the room, and then, stopping suddenly at the hearth, sprang up the chimney. "'I'm frightened you away at any rate,' observed Janet, laughing. "'And yet it may mean summat, she added, reflecting a little. "'For I neared say as our witches fly up chimneys on broomsticks to attend to their sabbaths. "'I should like to fly in that manner, and change myself into another shape, any shape but my own. "'Oh, that I could be as pretty as Alison! I don't know what I'd now do to be like her.' "'Again the great black cat was beside her, rubbing against her and purring. "'The child was a good deal startled.' for she had not seen him return, and the door was shut, though he might have come in through the open window, only she had been looking that way all the time, and had never noticed him. Strange. "'Tib,' said the child, patting him, "'thou hast now answered my last question. I always want to become a witch.' As she made this inquiry, the cat suddenly scratched her in the arm, so that the blood came. The little girl was a good deal frightened as well as hurt, 
and withdrawing her arm quickly made a motion of striking the animal. But starting backwards, erecting his tail and spitting, the cat assumed such a formidable appearance that she did not dare to touch him, and then she perceived that some drops of blood stained her white sleeve, giving the spots a certain resemblance to the letters J and D, her own initials. At this moment, when she was about to scream for help, though she knew no one was in the house, all having gone away with the Mayday revellers, a small white dove flew in at the open window, and skimming round the room alighted near her. No sooner had the cat caught sight of this beautiful bird, that instead of preparing to pounce upon it, as might have been expected, he instantly abandoned his fierce attitude, and uttering a sort of howl, sprang at the chimney as before. But the child scarcely observed this, her attention being directed towards the bird, whose extreme beauty delighted her. It seemed quite tame, too, and allowed itself to be touched, and even drawn towards her, without an effort to escape. Never surely was seen so beautiful a bird, with such milk-white feathers, such red legs, and such pretty yellow eyes, with crimson circles round them, so thought the little girl, as she gazed upon it, and pressed it to her bosom. In doing this, gentle and good thoughts came upon her, and she reflected what a nice present this pretty bird would make to her sister Alison on her return from the merry-making, and how pleased she should feel to give it to her and then she thought of Alison's constant kindness to her, and half reproached herself with the poor return she made for it, wondering she could entertain any feelings of envy towards one so good and amiable, all this while the dove nestled in her bosom. While thus pondering, the little girl felt an unaccountable drowsiness steal over her, and presently afterwards dropped asleep, when she had a very strange dream— it seemed to her that there was a contest going on between two spirits, a good one and a bad, the bad one being represented by the great black cat, and the good spirit by the white dove. What they were striving about she could not exactly tell, but she felt that the conflict had some relation to herself. The dove at first appeared to have but a poor chance against the claws of its sable adversary, but the sharp talons of the latter made no impression upon the white plumage of the bird, which now shone like silver armour, and in the end the cat fled, yelling as it darted off, "'Thou art victorious now, but her soul shall yet be mine!' Something awakened the little sleeper at the same moment, and she felt very much terrified at her dream, as she could not help thinking her own soul might be the one in jeopardy, and her first impulse was to see whether the white dove was safe. Yes, there it was, still nestling in her bosom, with its head under its wing." Just then she was startled at hearing her own name pronounced by a hoarse voice, and looking up she beheld a tall young man standing at the window. He had a somewhat gypsy look, having a dark olive complexion and fine black eyes, though set strangely in his head, like those of Janet and her mother, coal-black hair, and a very prominent features of a sullen and almost savage cast. His figure was gaunt, but very muscular, his arms being extremely long, and his hands unusually large and bony, personal advantages which made him a formidable antagonist in any rustic encounter, and in such he was frequently engaged, being of a very irascible temper and turbulent disposition. He was clad in a holiday suit of dark green serge, which fitted him well, and carried a nosegay in one hand and a stout blackthorn cudgel in the other. This young man was James Device, son of Elizabeth, and some four or five years older than Alison. He did not live with his mother in Whaley, but in Pendle Forest, near his old relative, Mother Demdike, and had come over that morning to attend the wake. "'What you about, Janet?' inquired James Device, in tones naturally hoarse and deep, and which he took as little pains to soften as he did to polish his manners, which were more than ordinarily rude and churlish. "'What you about, eh, say, wench?' he repeated. "'Why don't you go to the green to see the Morris dancers foot it round Maypole? "'Come along with me.' "'I don't know want to go, Jim,' replied the little girl. "'But you shan go, I tell ye,' returned her brother. "'You shan see your sister dance. "'You can sit her home any day. "'But May Day comes only once a year, "'and Alison will be queen twice in her life. "'So come along with me directly, or I'll make you.' "'I should like to see Alison dance, and so I wouldn't go with you, Jem,' replied Janet, getting up. 
"'Otherwise your orders shouldn't make me stir, I can tell you.' As she came out, she found her brother whistling the blithe air of green sleeves, cutting strange capers in imitation of the Morris dancers, and whirling his cudgel over his head instead of a kerchief. The gaiety of the day seemed infectious, and to have seized even him. People stared to see Black Jem, or Surly Jem, as he was indifferently called, so joyous, and wondered what it should mean. He then fell to singing a snatch of a local ballad at that time in vogue in the neighbourhood. "'If thou wilt na my secret tell, the brute a body well he parish, and swear to keep my counsel well, I will declare my day a marriage.' "'Come along, lass,' he cried, stopping suddenly in his song and snatching his sister's hand. "'What have you gotten there, lapped up in your kirtle, eh?' "'A white dove.' "'replied Jennet, determined not to tell him anything about her strange dream. "'A white dove?' echoed Jem. "'Give it me, and I'll wring its neck and get it roasted for supper.' "'You shouldn't do no such thing, Jem,' replied Jennet. "'I mean to give it to Alison.' "'Well, well, that's right,' rejoined Jem blandly. "'He'll make a pretty offering. Let's look at it.' "'No, no,' said Jennet, pressing the bird gently to her bosom. "'No one shall see it before I listen.' "'Come along, then,' cried Jem, rather testily, and mending his pace. "'Or we be too late for round.' "'Why, unscratch yourself,' he added, noticing the red spots on her sleeve. "'Anna?' she rejoined evasively. "'Oh, now I recollect it was Tib did it.' "'Tib?' echoed Jem gravely, and glancing uneasily at the marks." Meanwhile, on quitting the cottage, the May-day revellers had proceeded slowly towards the green, increasing the number of their followers at each little tenement they passed, and being welcomed everywhere with shouts and cheers. The hobby-horse curveted and capered, the fool fleered at the girls and flouted the men, jesting with every one, and when failing in a point, rapping the knuckles of his auditors. Friar Tuck chucked the pretty girls under the chin in defiance of their sweethearts, and stole a kiss from every buxom dame that stood in his way, and then snapped his fingers, or made a broad grimace at the husband. The piper played, and the taborer rattled his tambourine, the Morris dancers tossed their kerchiefs aloft, and the bells of the rush-cart jingled merrily, the men on the top being on a level with the roofs of the cottages, and the summits of the haystacks they passed, but in spite of their exalted position, jostling with the crowd below. But in spite of these multiplied attractions, and in spite of the gambols of the fool and horse, though the latter elicited prodigious laughter, the main attention was fixed on the May Queen, who tripped lightly along by the side of her faithful squire, Robin Hood, followed by the three bold foresters of Sherwood and her usher. In this way they reached the green, where already a large crowd was collected to see them and where in the midst of it and above the heads of the assemblage rose the lofty maypole, with all its flowery garlands glittering in the sunshine, and its ribbons fluttering in the breeze. Pleasant was it to see those cheerful groups composed of happy rustics, youths in their holiday attire, and maidens neatly habited too, and fresh and bright as the day itself. Summer sunshine sparkled in their eyes, and weather and circumstance as well as genial nature, disposed them to enjoyment. Every lass above eighteen had her sweetheart, and old couples nodded and smiled at each other when any tender speech, broadly conveyed but tenderly conceived, reached their ears, and said it recalled the days of their youth. Pleasant was it to hear such honest laughter and such good homely jests. "'Laugh on, my merry lads. You are made of good old English stuff.' loyal to church and king, and while you, and such as you, last, our land will be in no danger from foreign foe. Laugh on, and praise your sweethearts how you will. Laugh on, and blessings on your honest hearts. The frolic train had just reached the precincts of the green, when the usher, waving his hand aloft, called a momentary halt, announcing that Sir Ralph Asherton and the gentry were coming forth from the abbey gate to meet them. End of chapter 2